Okay, I think we will begin. Um, uh, my name is Tomlinson, and I uh, specialise in many of and architecture, and it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, our speaker for tonight. Before I do that, I should say that this is the penultimate work in medieval work in progress seminar this uh, term. We have one more on the 26th of June, I think, which will be Renana Bartle talking about her very interesting and very important um, uh, discoveries about a manuscript of the Meditazione of Vita Christi. So uh, do come along to that if you can. Um, uh, but uh, for tonight, the main event is uh, our very own Alex Bovey. Um, uh, it's rather hard introducing Alex because we know her under so many different uh, guises um, as head of research with an extraordinary range, wide range of, of interests and enthusiasms, uh, including things like pie charts. Um, uh, we know her as a kind of artist extraordinaire who seems to kind of master uh, a new medium every month and, and tweet about it, um, a kind of social media millennial and a uh, wandering millennial and um, uh, <laughs> uh, and general technophile uh, wearer of quite fabulous jewellery and shoes, we're and quite the frame um, uh, today, um, but also uh, aside from all those other activities um, and her extensive knowledge of, of pop culture and Beyonce lyrics, which is obviously, uh, for me anyway, very important, um, she uh, also uh, is a very active teacher, um, maybe some of her MA students uh, here today, and she has uh, a large number of, of PhD students as well, um, but she's also a researcher, which she um, uh, somehow manages to fit in uh, uh, between all her other activities. Um, uh, Alex, as some of you may know, studied here at Courtauld originally with John Loudon, um, and in a career that's taken her from the British Library to Kent and then back to uh, the Courtauld. She's uh, published widely on aspects particularly of manuscript culture, um, she has uh, authored a number of monographs on different uh, manuscripts, uh, the Chaworth Roll, a 14th century genealogy of the Kings of England, published in 2005, the same year she published um, on an early Renaissance guide to health. She's also um, uh, edited uh, a number of publications, so the British Archaeological Association Transactions on Canterbury um, uh, a few years ago, and a book uh, co edited with John Loudon uh, under the influence, the concept of influence, and the study of illuminated manuscripts published in 2007. Uh, her most recent um, book was on Jean de Carpentin's Book of Hours, The Genes of the Master of the Dresden Prayer Roll, Prayer Book, thank you, uh, published in 2011. And what she's speaking to us today about is her uh, project that's really looking at giants, um, and she, I'm sure, will tell us more about that. Um, we can expect um, uh, several years of thinking about uh, giants, and we can also expect a, an impressive joke per minute. Uh, <laughs> um, I like to my humour deviates uh, uh, somewhat, and sometimes deviant, but um, uh, she takes her theory of humour from Thomas Aquinas, which is why you, know, you have to forgive her. But uh, we could expect a lively um, and, I'm sure, very stimulating approach today. So, Alex, over to you. And thank you all for coming. Um, the historical present uh, is where I'm going to begin. The Bronze Age is coming to a dramatic end. It's 12,000, 1200 BC, and once thriving Mycenaean, Babylonian, and Anatolian civilizations are collapsing. The Shang Dynasty is replaced by the people of Zhu, who now control most of central China. Sophisticated, itinerant, and settled farming civilizations thrive in the Americas from the Arctic Circle all the way to Patagonia. And meanwhile, Phoenicians colonize the southern reaches of the Iberian Peninsula. The last dynasty of the New Kingdom, whose pharaohs were mostly named Ramesses, 
lose power to the high priests of Ammon, leading to ancient Egyptians, ancient Egypt's arrestingly named third intermediate period. <laughs> a decade of bitter war sparked by the divine gift of a golden apple and the abduction of the Queen of Sparta by Paris has ended with the sacking of the mighty Troy, the city probably located a few kilometers from the Aegean in modern day Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> the city has been torched and most of its inhabitants slaughtered or enslaved. The few survivors scatter. One clutch of refugees endures repeated displacement. Led by Aeneas, son of Prince Anchises and Aphrodite, they alight in Sicily, then Carthage, then Latium, now better known as Rome. Writing in the 1130s, something like two and a half thousand years after the fall of Troy, and availing himself of the accumulated development of this tale, Geoffrey of Monmouth picks up this story with Aeneas's great-grandson Brutus in his History of the Kings of Britain. Observing that Gildas the Wise and the Venerable Bede and Nennius had written nothing of the kings who lived here before Christ's incarnation, Geoffrey's history was by implication conceived as a prequel. His narrative begins with the aftermath of the fall of Troy. Aeneas has founded a kingdom in Italy, which has been passed on to his son Ascantius and then to his son Silvius, father of Brutus. Unable to escape a dreadful prophecy, Brutus kills his father in a hunting accident and is exiled to Greece. There he discovers other Trojan refugees enslaved to the king Pandrasus. Brutus leads them to freedom and then turns to the goddess Diana for advice about where they should go next. She tells them about an island to the west, once inhabited by giants, but now deserted, where they should found the new Troy. She says, from your descendants will arise kings who will be masters of the whole world. Brutus and his group then battle their way westward. Eventually, loaded with treasure plundered from the Gauls, they sailed to the island called Albion, making landfall at Totnes. Enhancing a circular... I know, it is funny that it's Totnes. I'll come back to that. <laughs> Enhancing a circular etymology offered by Isidore of Seville, who explains that Britannia takes its name from uh, its inhabitants, Geoffrey has Brutus rename the island after himself, and the Trojans thus become Britons. And I'm showing you here the golf map uh, of the late 14th century, which uh, I think is an extraordinary artifact that reveals detailed knowledge of uh, the geography of England, less so, you might argue, of Scotland. <laughs> and uh, we're a little bit better off in Wales. And I'm going to show you a detail now of the area boxed in red, which under... Um, uh, uh, Microscope, microscopic um, uh, examination, you can still just about, about make out the Latin inscription uh, next to the coastline uh, near Totnes and Dartmouth uh, and Plymouth, um, Hic Brutus Applicuit Cum Troianus, here landed Brutus with the Trojans. And uh, thus we can see that Geoffrey's history was written not just into books, it was also projected onto the landscape. Uh, as, uh, as a go the golf map and many other things we'll be looking at tonight reveal. Now, Diana was right about many things in her extraordinary prophecy, even rather uncannily predicting the ultimate extent of Britain's empire, which of course ultimately ensnared virtually a quarter of the globe. But she was wrong about one thing. The giants weren't extinct. As Geoffrey explains, Albion had no inhabitants, save for a few giants. And he describes these giants in his brief passage about them with tremendous economy, revealing incrementally that they're numerous, cave-dwelling, strong, and immensely tall. Only one gets a name in Geoffrey's text, and that is the abominable Gog Magog, 12 cubits tall and so strong that he could loosen and uproot an oak tree as if it were a, 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 twi a twig of hazel. Initially, landing uh, in the West Country, the Britons chased the giants that they encountered off to mountain caves, but this situation uh, didn't last. When Gog Magog and 20 other giants attacked and killed many Britons, the settlers retaliated, killing all of the giants except for Gog Magog, who was kept alive so that Brutus could see a wrestling match between this giant and his best friend Coroneus, 
who enjoyed beyond all reason, Jeffrey says, matching himself against monsters. And the final rib-cracking confrontation between Coroneus and Gog Magog is described in extraordinary, rather classicizing detail by Jeffrey. Coroneus hitches up his tunic, casts aside his weapons, and begins to wrestle the giant, their breath echoing through the air as all the spectators watch. Gog Magog, he says, swiftly gripped Coroneus with all his strength and broke three of his ribs. Coroneus is thus provoked to a tremendous fury, and summoning all his might, he lifted the giant on his shoulders and ran to a nearby shore. Coming to the edge of a high cliff, he heaved the mighty monster over uh, his head and then um, off into the sea. And as he fell down the rocky crag, the giant was torn into a thousand pieces and stained the sea red with his blood. The place, Geoffrey says, took its name from the giant's plunge and is still called Gog Magog's Leap. I'm showing this image mostly because when I showed it many years ago to Susie Nash, I think it caused her physical pain. <laughs> Especially because I chose to compare the giant's amazing hats with uh, <laughs> Giovanni Arnolfini's straw hat. <laughs> I almost did it again today, but I feel in these hollowed walls, you know, it would be a mistake. <laughs> anyway, Brutus then made his way east, and locating an auspicious spot in the Thames estuary, he founded the new Troy, later renamed London. And here, in what is to Susie's eyes, an offensive miniature, in a manuscript made in York uh, at the end of the 14th century, um, which fascinatingly produces this image and also a map and another map of the city of York upside down, the south at the bottom, um, uh, I think the procedure that uh, reflects the fact that it was made in that city and really gives priority to the north. We have, oh this doesn't work, uh, we have, well, in the upper reach, uh, the detail that I'm showing you has the tiny little Trojans arriving um, with the uh, very elegantly, rather continentally dressed uh, giants um, uh, uh, thumping back at them as they make their way in. And then in the lower part of the miniature, we have Brutus uh, instructing his stonemasons, busy in the foreground, as they construct uh, the walled city of London, I mean, New Troy, uh, entirely out of pink uh, marble. <laughs> in just a few pages, Geoffrey spun a foundation myth that placed the foundation of Britain in the deepest antiquity, Granting, an, granting the nation a pedigree as ancient as Rome's and alluding, knowingly or not, to prehistoric processes of migration and conquest that antedated even what we now think of sometimes as the Celts, but that we might prefer to describe as the people of Iron Age and Bronze Age Britain. It was a masterstroke, I think, of Geoffrey uh, to brand the most detestable of the giants, Gog Magog, for in doing so, he grafted his nationalist foundation myth onto a biblical stock, fusing Gog Magog, the Gog and Magog of Ezekiel and Revelation with an Alexandrian myth into a singular monster, and also alluding to uh, a remarkable, very brief uh, description in the book of Genesis that refers to uh, the antediluvian world as populated with giants who were then mostly obliterated uh, at the time of the flood. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> Given that Geoffrey killed off his giants almost immediately after inventing them, uh, he might well have been surprised that to this day their figures loom over London's Guildhall and every year the giants take a walk through the almost always rain-soaked streets of London, here with national treasure Giles Brandreth and also members of the guild that constructed these giants and will be returning to them uh, in a little while. So it is a tremendous delight to be speaking in the Medieval Work in Progress seminar this evening, 
This in my career is my third outing, if memory serves me right, which puts me, I think, at an average of one work in progress paper per decade. So it's quite a special occasion for me to be speaking to this group, and one that um, it makes me weirdly nervous, uh, not, and it's not just because John and Joanna are here, but it's partly because of that. Now, I want to, as always, I want to pause for just a second to think about this seminar, which was founded 40 years ago by aforementioned John and Joanna when they were research students at uh, the Courtauld, still then at Portman Square. And in a hastily, co hastily conducted bit of uh, oral history uh, yesterday, I, um, I learned about the origins of this seminar, which really were, according to Joanna, inspired by the deep estrangement from one another that uh, research students at the Courtauld experienced. She said that she didn't actually know who the other research students were. So they thought that if they had a kind of termly gathering, or maybe somewhat more frequently, um, without, the, uh, without their supervisors to share their research, it might uh, do something to spark a sense of camaraderie. And it seems to me pretty remarkable that we're all here tonight uh, that the community that was sparked off in those early days has now uh, grown up, <laughs> had children of its own, <laughs> gone to university, uh, come back again, and, uh, and uh, is enjoying, I think, a rather attractive middle age. Um, it, when I came to the Courtauld in 1995, uh, the seminar took place in this room, uh, where John and Joanna and I were last night, as we went in to see the wonderful pop-up exhibition that Tom Nixon and Lindy Grant and Tom Bilson have organized about uh, photographs from the Conway collection that show uh, uh, Notre Dame in the 19th and early 20th century. If you're at Somerset House, you must go and see it. If you can't, then it will be online soon enough. Um, and uh, this seminar room, which is now temporarily, as you know, the entrance to the building, was in my days as an MA and PhD student the main uh, place where this seminar happened. It was always very crowded, it was often extremely hot, and it had the most distressing kakashka <laughs> on the wall, the right-hand panel of his uh, celebrated Prometheus triptych. So in every seminar, we'd sit there huddled together. It's wonderful to see Eric here so often, a, a, a participant in, in those uh, occasions and director of the Courtauld, with Prometheus above us <laughs> looming, his liver perpetually picked out by ravens. And as Joanna uh, approaches a kind of apotheosis, apotheosis, what? There's no word. That is not a word. Uh, the apotheosis of becoming uh, emeritus professor shortly. It seems uh, like a nice uh, and appropriate moment to thank her and to thank John for uh, establishing this seminar uh, and for making uh, this place such an outstandingly welcoming and nurturing environment for medieval art historical research. So my paper tonight is adapted from a keynote that I gave at last year's Leeds International <laughs> Medieval Congress. And the theme of that conference was memory. And those of you, and there are a couple of you, I think, here who heard that paper, and you're most welcome to glaze over and let it all wash over you. I would be, I, I mean, we're using the facility of memory as described by Mary Carruthers uh, and others. Um, I wrote this paper in the context of what now turns out to have been an extended, in fact seemingly endless moment of international political upheaval, which has had some pretty serious consequences within the field of medieval studies. Now, as specialists in a millennium that is, at least for many outside these walls, synonymous with the exercise of great power by small elites, brutality, war, epidemic, famine, bureaucratic complexity, and general suffering, we have, I think, amongst ourselves, sufficient historical context to recognize that we are indeed living through a time of extraordinary political, social, and environmental challenge. But we also, I think, know that survival, and indeed progress, is possible, if not inevitable. The events of the past few years have made it impossible to ignore, as never before, the ways in which the Middle Ages can be appropriated and manipulated for evil ends. And I'm thinking especially, but not exclusively, of the appropriation of medievalizing imagery by white supremacists 
nativists, white nationalists, whatever you want to call them, uh, for example, at Charlottesville. And these external challenges are echoed within the field of medieval studies with debate about the exclusionary tendencies of a field so often focusing on major conferences like the International so uh, Society of Anglo-Saxonists, Kalamazoo, and the Leeds IMC. So as medievalists, we face a number of critical challenges about how we define our field and how we make sure that we open it up to questions and practitioners that have traditionally been marginalized or excluded, while at the same time facing down from, within, from without the nativists, the white nationalists, the white supremacists who march under a pseudo-medieval banner. Within these walls, we might ask ourselves what our opportunities and obligations are as art historians in these debates. Meanwhile, a credibility crisis has engulfed politics, journalism, and universities. What is true? Who to believe? What facts are fact facts and which are alternative facts? How do we disentangle fake news from, legitimate counterfeit, from the legitimate and counterfeit history from the real? Well, it might come as something as a relief that I'm not going to try to answer all of these questions tonight, even if they are, on some level, the baseline that runs underneath what I have to say. Instead, I'm going to use the legacy of Jeffrey's uh, foundation myth to consider how a myth, how fake history, can become real history, how it can become an active agent in the past and in our understanding of it, and especially how material things, books, landscapes, sculptures, and so forth, combined with human activity, making, writing, reading, listening, performing, spectating, can transform myth into a kind of reality of a particular and some kind of times peculiar kind. In engaging with this story, I am myself, and I'm sorry about this pun, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, for many great scholars from Raphael Hollinshed to Jeffrey Cohen have written about Jeffrey's tale. And in what follows, I'm not going to verbalize my footnotes. For this, you'll have to wait for the book that I will eventually finish on this topic. But even so, there can be no doubt that a story as complex as this can only result from the concerted efforts of many over a long period of time. If there is a distinguishing characteristic of my approach, it is this. That the story of Jeffrey's Giants can be seen, as it often has been, as a series of textual processes but that these are almost entirely driven by the creation of material things, including texts, but also significantly including the making of images from timber, wicker, papier-mâché, even latex, in scale ranging from manuscript miniatures to giant giants inscribed on the landscape. So when I was doing a diagram of what I was going to say, um, I made this uh, kind of quick summary of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, Jeff, that uh, reveals, I think, the bare bones of my argument, that Jeffrey's fake history reveals how we move uh, as a collective from making things up to making it real uh, through a kind of material process. So back to Jeffrey. Jeffrey's history was a sensational success, as witnessed by the large number of manuscript copies that survive. Julia Crick lists 215 copies of the Latin text alone, and even more emphatically by the many other texts that it inspired. His narrative was embellished, versified, translated, abbreviated, and expanded. Wace's Roman de Brut made the tale accessible in Anglo-Norman French uh, in the 1150s, and Lachman did the same in Middle English in, the, in around 1190. The Anglo-Norman French prose Brut was composed by 1300, and by 1400, the English prose version was in wide circulation. The footprint of the Latin, French, and English Brut was considerable, as attested by more than 240 manuscripts. As Lister Matheson pointed out in his indispensable study of the Middle English prose brute, this text alone survives in more manuscripts than any other Middle English work except the two Wycliffeite translations of the Bible. The tale was also written into and depicted alongside chronicle, history of chronicle histories of various kinds. Richard Wendover included the narrative in his Flores Historiarum, composed in the decade or so before his death in 1236, and later incorporated into the Chronica Maiora by his successor and much more famous chronicler at St. Albans, Matthew Paris. 
not to be confused with the Times journalist and former Tory MP, and no one will take me up on the idea that we should have a thing with Matthew Paris on Matthew Paris, you know? I, I just can't get, I can't get that commission, but uh, it would be good, I think. Uh, they have a lot in common. Um, anyway, Matthew, back to Matthew Paris, uh, the old, um, underscoring the great antiquity and perhaps staking a truth claim for the story Wendover wedged uh, Jeffrey's story between episodes that he had recast from the Book of Judges and the Book of Kings. In the margin nearby, in his uh, autograph version of uh, this history, Matthew shows the Trojans offering a libation of wine and heart's blood to Diana, who is shown here with rather wonderful ankle wings and antlers and possibly even a garment you could describe as a sarong. <laughs> Suzanne Lewis's uh, um, monograph on the Chronica is very much worth reading for her remarks on this eccentric, rather fascinating image. Elsewhere in Matthew's oof, he makes an entirely visual allusion to the giants. In uh, this manuscript, a gallery of kings prefaces the incomplete chronicle text. Brutus, holding a ship and a scepter, is the first of 32 kings, which trace a line from Brutus through Uther Pangdragon and King Arthur to more readily documented kings, from Ethelbert to Henry III. Three large figures are in a heap at his feet. Their scale, gurning expressions, prominent brows, and undulating noses revealing that they are the giants that Brutus uh, conquered and then exterminated. The Trojan extermination of the giants is affixed very unusually to the start of a role genealogy of the kings of England, which usually, this kind of genre, usually sidesteps the legendary uh, br brute history um, and King Arthur by beginning the story perhaps with a diagram of the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy and with Egbert, the first king of a united England. Geoffrey's brief story was cast as the inciting incident for all British history, yet it did not escape the notice of his readers that he left some vital questions unanswered. All well and good to have the British nation founded by giant exterminating Trojans, but where had the giants come from? In the 13th century, an explanation emerged for their origins, which swapped the conventional explanation of the ancient name of Albion as a derivation of the Latin Albus after the white cliffs along the south coast for something much, much sexier. The Anglo-Norman French poem Grand Géant explained that the king of Greece has 33 daughters, the eldest of whom was named Albion, Albina. These proud sisters were unwillingly married off to 33 princes. Albina convinces her sister to murder their spouses, but one of the sisters inadvertently reveals the scheme to her husband and then to their father. The king, enraged, imprisons the treacherous sisters and then judges that they should, rule, should be exiled by setting them out to sea in a ship with neither a rudder nor food. Eventually, after a long and arduous journey, they arrive on a verdant, uninhabited island, which Albina names after herself. The, the sisters then gorge themselves on the fruits of the land, herbs, berries, apples, venison, and so much more, until they get, and I'm quoting, uh, big and fat. And they also <laughs> long for human company to satisfy their growing lust. Perceiving this situation, wicked spirits called incubi take human form and seduce the sisters. It's a very creepy passage, actually. It describes that despite their human disguise, the sisters don't see them because they come to them in the dead of night and the sisters, and I'm quoting, only felt what a woman should feel with a man. <laughs> the giants, later encountered by the Trojans, are the offspring of these wicked sisters and their incubi lovers. Why is this not in the national curriculum? I mean, it's like, it, along with my Matthew Paris on Matthew Paris idea, yet yeah, another brilliant idea that just won't get traction where it needs to. Anyway, um, at least they liked it in the 15th century. Uh, and I'm showing you here an unusually splendid uh, copy of the uh, Middle English prose brute that's in the Bodleian Library, which uh, begins this part of the text. It's a manuscript that contains a surprisingly interesting heraldic treatise, uh, and then turns to the story of brute. And this is at the very beginning of that text. It has three miniatures in it, each marking a moment of conquest. The first 
by Albina, and in the upper register you see Greek king Diocletian um, trying to marry off his daughters to these rather boring looking princes, and they've all got their wrists crossed in what turns out to be a fake gesture of submission. And then in the lower register, their um, completely ill-equipped ship with, the, um, uh, with uh, no provisions and no sail and no oars, uh, as they disembark with Albina wearing the most glamorous gold and ermine dress. And her name, you won't be able to see it in this miniature, but her name is inscribed on a band of her costume, sort of brushing off her shoulders as her, as her sisters either bow down before her or just have a little stretch. And uh, with an allusion uh, to their um, future offspring sleeping in the landscape, a kind of evocation of the idea that um, the, in these islands, the landscape is in fact forged by the bodies of giants, uh, a recurring motif, as many of you will know, especially those of you who golf at the Gog May Gog golf course in Cambridgeshire. Anyone here know Debbie Stani? I don't think she golfs, but I think she knows the golf course and the hills. Um, so um, this uh, is followed very swiftly by um, the second conquest of Britain by the Trojans, who arrive with much better appointed ships. I think you'll be able to compare the difference between um, the sexy sisters' uh, poorly equipped ships and the, and the Trojans' very good ones. Um, with, in the foreground, uh, the future uh, Duke of Cornwall throwing the, uh, the, the giant Gog Magog, here styled as a kind of wild man, but wearing, um, I, I think, a, a belt and a headband made of twisted vines that some of you will already know, reminds me um, of the uh, that kind of phase in the 1980s for aerobics films. You remember with John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis? It was also about the time my MA students will really know this, because we had to stop a seminar to watch Save a Prayer by Duran Duran. It seemed at the time like educational malpractice not to share this with them. But in that video, Simon Le Bon is also wearing um, a headband and, in that case, Terry Tal wristbands that uh, are very much like what we see on Gog Magog here as he makes his final journey over the cliff edge. Also kind of interesting um, to me in this miniature is the inscription of the story onto the landscape here, uh, or perhaps seascape even here very literally, with uh, the words, the thought of Gog Magog, a direct quotation from Geoffrey, the, the leap of Gog Magog, which Geoffrey says, as I've already shared with you, um, is the name of this site um, uh, to this day, he says. So although the, um, the, the Grand Géant and then uh, later the Al Albina tale as it was absorbed into the Brute legend um, solves the problem of the origins of the giants. It also raised a new question. How could the tale of the giants' lineage have been transmitted if this was an inarticulate species that was exterminated as soon as the Britons arrived? This is um, implicitly, and to my understanding, uniquely addressed in the, uh, in the Grand Géant poem. As in Geoffrey's tale, Brutus spares the life of Gog Magog, but in this case his motive is not to stage a clifftop death match with his best friend. Instead, he, the king Brutus sits down with the, hi, this highly articulate giant and quizzes him about the origins of his race. How, Brutus asks, had the giants come to Albion? What was their origin and what was their lineage? How long had they been there? Gog Magog recounts his history and the text says, one leader to another, as Brutus listens. A kind of a very rare example in any of these texts of the, a monster speaking and of someone in a position of power listening. Quite a moment to, to pause on in this long tradition. And after Gog Magog tells his story, Brutus promises to preserve the marvels of the deed and the story. And the poet, anonymous poet, sadly, reflects, Brutus surely remembered it all, so that afterwards others might know, and surmises that Brutus shared the story at feasts. And those of you who have read poems like Beowulf will know very well about the tradition of, um, of royalty and nobility telling tales, telling historical tales, in halls is a very kind of foundational part of a kind of uh, an ancient medieval uh, oral tradition, and I think that's what this poet is alluding to—a kind of kingly responsibility to share history. 
And the poem ends with a bold, yet extraordinarily banal, defense of historical memory. It says, it is proper and right to remember all of this, and no harm in knowing what happened in the past. <laughs> Not something I'm going to be writing in our ref impact state. <laughs> no harm in knowing about the art of the past. Um, but still, a kind of interesting acknowledgement in a kind of mythical text of the importance of the past. And elsewhere in this text, and with an eye on the material record, the poet also observes that the bones of giants can still be discovered in multitude all across the land. It says, in the country and the city, men are able to find a great deal of teeth, arm, and leg bones, some four feet long. Men are terrified to see some as large as a shield. So many of these are found in fortifications that men are able to see and discuss what manner of men had such bones. And this is a kind of idea that interpreting overly large ancient bones was something that was an inciting incident for tale telling, but also something that needed to be explained in the material record. And those of you who've looked at cathedral treasuries, and I can see a few of you in the audience tonight, will know that giant bones were often, along with unicorn um, horns and, and other wonders, a uh, part of those collections. So, des grands géants opened the door to the imaginative possibility that Gog Magog might have had something to say for himself. And as Gog Magog tells his story, the myth begins to mutate from a tale of violent conquest to one in which the giants emerge as potent, articulate emblems of the nation, a point to which I shall return. But for now, the landscape. The identification of this story with place is rooted in Geoffrey's text. It, as, it's still called Gog Magog's Leap, the Saltus Gog Magog uh, in, in Geoffrey's Latin. And we have seen how Brutus's landing inscribed on, uh, we, uh, landing, we've seen how Brutus's landing is inscribed on the Gough map near Totnes. Of this phenomenon, John Clark, emeritus curator of the Museum of London, has written, none of this is history, however, it may be geography. And Clark has demonstrated that it's unlikely that Geoffrey had the town itself in mind as the site of the Trojan landing. Observing that Totnes is 11 miles up the river Dart and not itself suitable for a large feet fleet, and I'm going to quote the funniest bit of this wonderful article, he says, it's not suitable for a large fleet, fictional or real. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that's um, too small for a fictional. Um, <laughs> um, Clark has called attention to the vagueness of Jeffrey's geography. John Clark has, suge has suggested on etymological and geological grounds that this cliff in, the, in this photo, which is one of his own, might be identified with the cliff behind Salcombe Castle, with the red stone of its shoreline summoning up Jeffrey's assertion that the giant's blood stained on the site of his death permanently. A kind of wonderful example of how tales describe material things up to and including um, natural phenomena like the landscape. In the Middle Ages, if not earlier, Gog Magog's Leap was especially, but not uh, exclusively, associated with a place known uh, latterly as Plymouth Hoe. Records from 1486 onwards document that a giant cut into the chalk of Plymouth Hoe, overlooking the limestone cliffs, was known locally as Gog Magog's Leap. By the early 17th century, there were two figures carved in the turf on the hoe. And in 1602, the antiquarian Richard Carew recounted that he'd seen upon the hoe haw at Plymouth, cut into the ground, the portraiture of two men, the one bigger, the other lesser, with the clubs in their hands, whom they term Gog Magog. And he says that he has learned that it is renewed by order of the townsmen when cause, when cause requireth. And that reflects other records that we have in the town accounts from the earlier 15th century that shows that when the weeds began to consume the chalk figures, the people of the towns would club, club together and, um, and re-carve their figures. Um, the figures were obliterated in the 1660s when a citadel was erected on Plymouth Hoe. Um, uh, and, and what I'm showing you is its approximate location uh, on this image. Um, but it wouldn't be fair not to show you a relevant example, the great tumescent Cern Abbas giant in Dorset. And one of the great um, kind of fascinating, unanticipated outcomes of working on this is when I talk about it in places in the West Country, people come forth with amazing tales um, about the landscape and about their experience of it. And in the case of Cern Abbas giant, there is a, a long-standing 
uh, practice, that uh, belief that infertility can be cured by selecting a particular location on the chalk giant in order to attempt to conceive a child. And there are, I gather, in fact, people who claim to this day that they were conceived on that location uh, in the CERN of Bass Giant's body. Um, now, consensus was not total about the location of Gog Magog's fall. Adapting William Caxton's Brute Chronicle, which had been published in 1481, Robert Fabian locates the events on the Dorset coast. He was a Londoner, maybe, the, sorry, on the, on, the, on the Kent coast. Um, as Julia Boffey and Matthew Payne have shown, this chronicle was written in Fabian's own hand and embellished uh, by collaging and tinting printed manuscripts, uh, collaging, tinted, printed, and some manuscript elements onto the page. It's an absolutely fascinating thing for someone to do um, uh, in the, you know, well into the age of print. And this wonderful miniature, uh, which you can probably see is certainly collaged on with this uh, border, hand-colored, that's been pasted on around it, um, is the finest in this manuscript, and also, I think, the finest in the whole tradition. I mean, Susie may have an opinion about um, uh, wanting to locate it to a particular uh, geopolitical formation, but uh, suffice it to say, it's um, colored inside the lines and not as uh, shocking as the one that I showed from York. <laughs> it's very nicely painted. Um, and it also, I think, demonstrates a compelling tragicomic sense as the doomed giant is flung to his death in the middle distance. For me, the lost giants of Plymouth and the miniature pasted into Fabian's Chronicle operate as a metaphor for the collaborative material nature of storytelling. A community made and weeded the landmark Plymouth giant keeping it legible. And Fabian's collaging speaks to his labor as a historiographer, as well as his activity as a manuscript maker. Both, I think, underscore that this was a story that was made as well as told. But was it believed? Fabian availed himself of Caxton's printed brute as he made his manuscript, and in so doing, appealed to Caxton's authority, a trope that echoed Jeffrey's own claim that the beginning of the history was uh, at the beginning of the history that his work was a translation of a very old book in the British tongue, remarking that the, with, including the very reassuring detail, that the book had been given to him by a certain Walter Archdeacon of Oxford. And some people, including uh, the great medievalist uh, R.W. Southern, thinks that we should take that seriously as a claim, that it's actually quite possible. And I didn't, wouldn't want to disagree with Southern in this or any context. So it may be that Walter was real. But we are, I think, within our rights to wonder. In the 1980s, there was a banner in the newsroom of Kelvin McKenzie's Sun newspaper. Make it fast, make it first, and make it accurate, it said. And as one legend has it, someone added to this sign in neat felt tip, if all else fails, make it up. <laughs> Did Geoffrey have the first edition of this banner in an ancient British tongue given to him by Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, pinned to his desk? Did Trojan refugees, led by a man descended from Aphrodite and Aeneas, exterminate a race of indigenous giants and found London as the new Troy in 1200 BC? And before that, was this island colonized by 33 wicked queens who mated with the devil and populated the land with their giant progeny? We would not be the first to raise an eyebrow at Geoffrey's narrative and its later embellishments. By the 1190s, William of Newborough had slated Henry for having invented the most ridiculous fictions. For early modern historiographers, keen to demonstrate their ability to discriminate between fact and friction, fiction, the brute threw up interpretative challenges with its emulsification of the plausible, the demonstrable, and the obviously fa uh, fabulous. Polydor Virgil, in the 16th century, derided Geoffrey's his history as ancient British fables that he had embroidered by himself and passing it off as honest history by giving it the coloration of the Latin language. He complained that while Livy, Dionysius, and Halicarnassus, and many others wrote diligently about Roman antiquities, they never made mention of any Brutus. Others, too, piled in on Geoffrey. William Camden reported that Geoffrey's history is yet of little authority amongst men of learning. 
Thomas Cooper's Dictionarium Historicum et Poeticum, published in 1565, condemned the Albina story as containing neither similitude of truth, reason, or honesty. And in his Britannia Antiqua Illustrata, which I'll be showing you a picture of a little bit later, Aylett Sams in the 17th century sniffed that the Brutus story was an old vanity of the world, deriding the tendency to refer their beginning to some divine hero. Aylett Sams, by the way, his book that this is in attributes everything to the Phoenicians. So um, there is, um, he was keen, I think, to dissociate uh, himself from one legend in order to harness his interpretation of the past to another. In the preface to the first English translation of Geoffrey's history, published in 1718, Aaron Thompson rehearsed his objections to the legitimacy of Geoffrey's story at length. Whereas most of Geoffrey's critics read his history as an unabashed lionization of the British, Thompson took a contrary view. Far from being an apologist, Geoffrey's history was a very severe invective against his own countrymen. Geoffrey's aims was not so much to write the history as to relate the calamities of his country, the better to expose the vices and notorious wickednesses of his country, and so forth. He carries on in this vein for some pages. So, from the 12th century to the 18th, we have many authorities pointing out that Geoffrey's story was perforce fake history. And yet during these centuries, the story took on new life, regardless of the historiographer's judgments, for this is a story that was made not just in words, but in things. And in literature, cartography, monument, and performance, London's identity as the new Troy uh, was asserted continuously, as here in a verse that I'm sure you've been looking at on um, uh, detail from the so-called Agas map of the, 70, of the 16th century. We'll move to another rather more delicious uh, 17th century view of the city of London um, while old St. Paul still stood. <coughs> and a detail in which you can examine the heads, decapitated heads, like pineapples in the, in the toothpicks in the southern tower of, uh, of London Bridge. In April 1413, a giant greeted the soon-to-be-crowned Henry V as he rode into the city across London Bridge for his coronation. When he returned triumphantly into the city after the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, he was greeted this time by two giants posted at the southern side of London Bridge, which an anonymous chronicler claims were intended by the city to express its praise and embellish itself. Giants were again in place on the bridge to greet Henry and his new bride, Catherine of Valois, in 1421, two days before her coronation. This is to me very tantalizing. Who were these giants? We have to wait for more than a century to find the city giants identified with Geoffrey's personnel. On the 18th of August, 1554, as uh, Mary Tudor and Philip of Spain rode into the city in advance of their wedding, they came to London Bridge where two great giants greeted them with Latin verses painted in silver, one named Coroneus Britannus and the other Gog Magog Albionis. These giants were almost certainly the ones that were reused five years later for the extravagant procession of Elizabeth I from the Tower to Whitehall on the 14th of January, 1559, the day before her coronation. A pamphlet describing the event of the pageant, published nine days after, relates that as she departed uh, the city through Temple Bar, which is the um, uh, uh, westernmost uh, dot on my diagrammatic map, uh, she encountered the two images of Gog, Magog, the Albion, and Coronaeus the Briton, two giants, big in stature, who carried verses in Latin and English, hailing her as uh, the rightful queen, and I think by implication criticizing her sister and Philip of Spain. In making these giants, the city of London appears to have remade, or maybe deliberately forgotten, the story. The once significant enmity between Gog, Magog, and Coronaeus was forgotten, as was the David-Goliath size differential, and uh, Coronaeus, in the process, was promoted to the status of a giant. The next ap appearance of the giants, who were identified with Geoffrey's history, came in the Lord Mayor's show for the inauguration of Leonard Halliday in 1605, shortly after the death of Elizabeth I and the accession of James. 
By then, the Lord Marischaux had developed into a hugely elaborate annual affair with solemn processions from the Guildhall to Whitehall via the river and a return journey that was met with itinerant pageants. And Tracy Hill's pageantry and power provides a brilliant history of this, uh, of this show from 1585 to 1639 when it, well, it fell into abeyance. Halliday's show, written by Anthony Monday, no less, positions James I as the second ruler of a united Britain, asserting the new king as the descendant of Brutus. And here is uh, the pageant route that uh, people would follow once they uh, returned with their wonderful fest ships festooned with heraldry um, onto St. Paul's Wharf and made their way to the Guildhall. According to Monday's text, Corneas and Gog Magog were to appear at the beginning of the route taken by the new mayor and the guildsmen as they returned. In the shape and proportion of huge giants, it says, fettered with golden chains to Britannia's mount, showing much envy and contention as they compete to show her the greatest duty and service. Britannia herself, uh, the text uh, explains, is to be on a mount triangular where she's accosted by female personifications of her divided kingdoms, England, Wales, and Scotland. She converses about the renaming of the nation Britain with Brute, her conqueror, seated below her, in the habit, it says, of an adventurous warlike Trojan. <laughs> Brutus mansplains to Britannia how happy she should be about his victory, for he has brought civility and manners to the island, hitherto a vast wilderness inhabited by giants and mere, a mere den of monsters. Because of him, Gog Magog and his barbarous brood were quite subdued he explains to her. Now, in this pageant, all the speaking parts were to be played, as was common practice, by male children. Adult actors, in this occasion, very unusually, were paid to go in the giants, uh, so the text says, and 10 shillings, other records reveal, were spent on stilts for them to wear. So we have a cast of children with grown adult actors stilted up to make this kind of imposing spectacle. Um, <coughs> And it must indeed have been uh, pretty magnificent to see uh, the stilted up and costumes giant dwarfing the children who were playing Brutus Britannia and the personifications as they made their way through the streets. Unfortunately, however, we must remember the umbrellas, because uh, they are irrelevant. Uh, unfortunately, great rain and foul weather prevented the pageant from going ahead as planned on the day of the mayor's inauguration. And great expense was laid out to dry out and repair the costumes, rehire the actors, and stage the pageant on a more clement day. And those records give us a further, very rich account of the amount of labor and skill that went into mounting such pageants and making and reusing the giant costumes. When not in use in the pageants, giant figures were kept on public display in the guild hall, and they're mentioned in passing by often perplexed visitors. The Guildhall sheltered the giants from the rain and promoted them as emblems of the city, but it couldn't protect them from the fire that destroyed most of the city of London in 1666. As the city around them was rebuilt, the giants were replaced with bigger, better creations. In his text for the 1672 Lord Mayor Show, Thomas Jordan describes how new giants were made to replace the ones destroyed in the Great Fire at the expense of the city. The new extreme great giants, each one of them 15 feet high, were drawn by horses and delighted spectators by moving, talking, and taking tobacco as they ride along. So now they not only speak, they also can smoke. Amazing. After the show, they were destined for the Guildhall, where they may daily be seen all the year. Installed at Guildhall and in between shows, these giants did not necessarily attract the understanding and admiration of their audience. When the satirist Ned Ward encountered them in the guild hall, uh, in, uh, in, I can't remember exactly the year, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward, in uh, 1699, uh, he heaped scorn on the two lubberly, preposterous figures he saw and reckoned that their purpose was to show the city what huge lubies their forefathers were. <laughs> Luby, we need to get that word back into circulation. <laughs> The giants described by Jordan and mocked by Ward had a limited life expectancy, battered by the weather and the crowds on their annual procession, and even on one rather remarkable occasion, taken down, floated on a barge in the Thames, and packed with fireworks for the entertainment of James II and Mary of Modena. 
The city of London was concerned that they were in an advanced and embarrassing state of disrepair by the early 18th century, and they commissioned a man known only to the records as Captain Richard Saunders, a freeman of the Joiners Company, to make a new set of giants, which were installed in 1708. And here is one view of Saunders' giants, probably from a postcard from, I don't know, I'm guessing the 1920s or 30s. And here's another view. They weren't initially installed under the great um, window. Uh, they were in a kind of clock tower, but they were moved in the early 19th century into this, uh, into this spot. And um, although they are they're huge, but they're kind of dwarfed by their surroundings. So um, using the magic of PowerPoint and a deep sentimentality for Andre the Giant in Princess Bride, uh, I will reveal that they were uh, 14 feet tall. Andre the Giant was seven foot four. So he's approximately, oh, sorry. That was all you get of Andre the Giant. Uh, he was approximately um, uh, two Andres high. <laughs> Nevertheless, and I'm going to go back, actually, uh, they didn't impress everyone. Seeing them in 1710, the German traveller and diarist Zacharias von Uffenbach complained that London's Guildhall was undistinguished as an architecture. He was astonished that it was such a poor quality building for such a mighty city. And he went on to say that the two giant forms bearing a shield opposite the entrance are most wretched. The sight of them would make anyone laugh, for their bodies are quite monstrous, while their legs are like those of a badger. And the truth is, he's exactly right. They are like a badger. But that, I'm afraid, is a story for another day, uh, drawing in um, uh, shipwrights and, uh, and ship car carving and, uh, and uh, hypothesis that Captain Richard Saunders uh, was uh, more accustomed to making figures that didn't have legs <laughs> for that reason. Um, Saunders' uh, new giants prompted many fascinating textual responses. The earliest and most significant being, oh no, not now, there we go. The most significant being Thomas Borman's 1741 gigantic history of the two famous giants. Addressing young readers, Borman provides a potted history of the giants, taking pains to identify them correctly and dismissing various erroneous identifications, including, amongst others, Samson and Hercules, as well as the biblical Gog and Magog, and insisting that Gog Magog is the giant to the left and Coronaeus with his imperial shield on the right. He vivified these majestic giants with a completely seductive account of their lineage, and in doing so, sidestepped the Albina legend in preference to a paternal and parthenogenic lineage. Saunders, for Borman, was their father, and their grandfathers were the old, weak, and feeble giants whose entrails had been eaten up by the city rats and mice. The new Coronaeus and Gog Magog, he says, behave peaceably to all mankind, leaving their stations only to step down for their dinners at noon, yet no one has ever seen them do so, because either they happen to come on a fast day, or the giants, growing older now, are more shy of company. And he describes how their valet de chambre sometimes shaved them, which last necessary article they stand in great need of at the present time, being obliged by the unreasonable length of their beards to eat as much hair as victuals. <laughs> Witty in form and content, the gigantic history was sold at the giant's feet in the guild hall. In its materiality, the publication ingeniously plays with scale. The massive scale of the guild hall sculptures, the petite book, and the young reader who's transformed into a giant when she holds it in her hands. Moreover, in drawing the little masters and misses of London, London's reading classes to the imaginative potential of the story, it gave it new life which was taken up by subsequent generations of pamphleteers, playwrights, and satirists, and later recast by Charles Dickens, no less, as loquacious giants in his very unsuccessful uh, Master Humphrey's Clock, later recast as one of his other novels. In Borman's retelling, the giants are not just capable of speaking, they're also avid listeners, eavesdropping on the events of the day in the Guildhall, looming over the great events of the city, and remembering events stretching back to the foundation of the nation. The interplay between the sculptures, their pageant avatars, and the city as written, pictured and performed, is, across the centuries, constantly subject to processes of discussion, destruction by rain, time, neglect, fireworks, and so forth, and by remaking, by forgetting, even the giants' names get forgotten and fused and confused, and, um, and in between, 
also invention. The process of destruction and invention carried on through the 20th century. The Guildhall joints Giants were destroyed in a night of the Blitz, so devastating that it came to be known as the Second Great Fire of London. This is the night that legendarily Winston Churchill said that everyone must put their effort into saving St. Paul's, and the Guildhall and several other Wren churches uh, were destroyed. Amazingly, though, by 1953, a new set of giants was ready for installation, carved by David Evans. These are the giants that are in place today. And we have this wonderful uh, Pathé news footage with an incredibly clipped <laughs> uh, uh, a commentary over the top uh, explaining about how the giants are being reinstalled. So it was clearly a great priority to restore the Guildhall and the giants to their rightful space. Standing just nine feet tall, these were austerity giants. Their installation marked by um, uh, the moving images that we've just seen for the first time, and also a series of documentary photographs that are, for other reasons, I think really fascinating about the uh, scaling up from maquette to the full sculpture um, uh, in the artist's workshop. Thereby, as you might imagine, uh, hangs uh, yet another tale. The pageant giants, too, have a complex material history. In the 1830s, the pageant tradition was revived with two new great giants made for the Lord Mayor's Parade, shown in an inconspicuous corner of David Roberts' great view of the procession past uh, St. Paul's in 1836, with wonderful, I think, image, a detail of, of men heaving on great ropes to pull the giants through the streets. And then the students of St. Regent's Polytechnic, now the University of Westminster, about which I have nothing to say other than that it's stolen for an inch from us. Um, uh, but anyway, when, when, well, before then, when we can forgive it for uh, not having lived out that dreadful history, was the Regent Street Polytechnic. Um, uh, we see a group of women uh, charged with making pageant giants uh, for the procession. Um, his feet and, uh, and his head, and then attached in this very masculine space of uh, the city street as it's pulled along. Um, and that must be Gog, Magog, I think, um, with his great uh, spiked club. In 2006, the feeling that the latex giants, shown uh, on the left here, they're conjoint twins, incidentally, um, the latex giants that it had been in use in the pageants for the previous years were a bit infra dig. The Worshipful Company of Basket Makers made a new pair of giants, this time from exposed wicker. Perhaps, or perhaps not, a deliberate evocation of the druidic practice of sacrificing humans in a wicker man reported by Julius Caesar, and revived, oh dear, we need to go back so that you can enjoy this a little bit longer, and revived by Aylett Sams in 1676 with its unforgettable illustration uh, of the wicker man being absolutely jammed with human sacrifices and, um, uh, and, and tinder waiting to be uh, set lit uh, at the feet. Um, and then this story was, of course, brought to audiences worldwide in Hammer Horror's 1973 classic, the, the horrifying um, and sometimes rather amusing uh, Wicker Man. Let's go to the next one now. There we go. I'm ending, then, as I began, in the historical present, which is, of course, more than just a verb tense used to dramatize the past by casting it in the present. To paraphrase the great historiographer E.H. Carr, whether we use the historical present or not, when we cross out, whether we cross out personal pronouns in our students' essays in favor of the passive voice and the mysterious we, as students of the past, we're not watching history parade by from the balcony. We, each of us, are part of the procession. In the case of Jeffrey's Giants, the metaphor takes on a literal dimension. The makers who illuminated manuscripts, incised cliff tops, carved oak timbers, <laughs> wove willow, inflated massive balloons, they made history by hand, adding to the material record of this story, eight centuries old and counting. The term collective memory has a tangled and interesting pedigree, but for the sake of brevity, let's use Chi Wang's definition of it as a socially shareable memory system that encompasses active, constructive processes 
of both individuals in time and space. And I can see you're thinking that it's as if he's describing this photograph of these people making and then uh, hauling upwards the uh, giant for a 1928 procession. Surely Wang's definition describes rather brilliantly the, descri the survival of the giant, so much a product of active constructive processes. Yet this definition leaves out the collective forgetting, the not knowing, as a creative force. In the end, this is a story that was principally manufactured by and for elites until the 20th century, almost exclusively demonstrably masculine, from Jeffrey himself to the owners of the brute manuscripts to the corporate bodies, the guilds and corporation of the city of London, who have over centuries commissioned and paid for new giants. Although Jeffrey's foundation myth feels a lot like a folk tale, it is rather a tale for the folk or maybe which is indifferent to the folk, to the crowd standing in the rain, who cheer the floats, can't hear the words, who take pleasure in skewering or ignoring the pomposity of the cavalcade. And even those who tell the story are a little unsure of who the giants are, Gog and Magog, or Gog, Magog and Coronaeus, maybe Samson and Hercules, whether they're friends or foes, or that one of them represents an indigenous race stamped out by the refugee conquerors represented by the other. But it doesn't really matter. Because even if the giants are real in their physicality, they're also made up. So the forgetting doesn't generate the wrong story, it provokes new ones. We are also rememberers and forgetters and inventors. Blessed for us art historians are the makers, the fabricators, the scribes, the illuminators, the sculptors, the basket makers, who demonstrate that tales survive not just because of words, but, be, but in response to things. If Jeffrey made up the story, then others made it real. His giants are actors in history, which is perhaps what the great historiographer George Michael had in mind when he described our collective task so eloquently. All we have to do now is take, make, take these lies and make them true somehow. Thank you.